twice impeached, loser of the 2020 election, and now indicted former President Donald Trump, was arrested this week. As Trump was pleading not guilty to 34 felonies in a lower Manhattan courtroom, all eyes focused on Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg's indictment and accompanying statement of facts. Other than Trump, there was one other man who figures prominently in that case, Michael Cohen. The one-time attorney and fixer for Trump, Cohen watched his camera-loving former boss looking very unhappy as he was led by law enforcement into the courtroom where he faced the judge he has repeatedly attacked in unhinged posts on his social media platform. So what to make of this week's historic moment? Joining us now is Michael Cohen. He's the host of the Mea Culpa podcast, co-host of the Political Breakdown podcast, as well as the best-selling author of Both Revenge, How Donald Trump Weaponized the U.S. Department of Justice Against His Critics, and Disloyal, a memoir, the true story of the former personal attorney to President Donald J. Trump. Michael, good morning. Thanks for joining us. How did it feel to watch Tuesday's arraignment of Donald Trump on 34 felony counts of falsification of business records? You know, it's interesting because so many people contacted me, whether it was by, you know, social media or text emails saying, you know, this must feel great. Finally, there's vindication. And that's not how I felt. It's not how I felt at all. Uh, I'm glad that accountability is finally at Donald's doorstep. But at the end of the day, it's a very sad day for America in the fact that you know, he's the first president in U.S. history to be indicted. And it's such a terrible look for the United States of America, especially in the eyes of foreigners, in the eyes of our allies. And I think it also shows an inherent weakness to our adversaries. So it's a terrible day for America, but it is a good day for justice and accountability. Michael, you told Robert Costa that you expected to see, quote, complete and total mayhem at Trump's arraignment, and yet there was a total dud there, very few supporters and no protests. But we did see Trump slink back to Mar-a-Lago immediately after that court hearing. Your thoughts on why Trump didn't try to grandstand while he was in New York City? Well, first of all, that's one prediction that I could not be happier that I got wrong. I mean, I've been right on so many predictions. This is one that I am ecstatic. I mean, the tens and tens of Trump supporters that were there, including, you know, Marjorie Toilet Green, who just sat there, you know, and the second she got to New York, she got the good old Bronx cheer, and they ran her right out. I think she was here for all of 30 seconds. She realized there was no support. And the same thing with George Santos. Um, I mean, he's, he's another one that got booted out of the uh, downtown area extremely quickly. The one thing that, of course, that we all saw, and Donald could say whatever he wants, we all saw the look on his face as the door slammed and, you know, the police officer didn't even hold the door for him as he was coming through. You could see the look of not just anger, but fear, complete and total fear in his eyes. And that's why he needed to run back immediately to Mar-a-Lardo so that he can go ahead and he could, you know, inflate that deflated ego of his by having, what, dinner with Marjorie Taylor Greene and, um, you know, Matt Gates and surrounded by all of those ridiculous acolytes and followers, many of whom were probably employees that filled, um, you know, the ballroom there when he went on to do exactly what Judge Mershon told him not to do, told him, stop with the violence, stop with the hatred speech, stop with the attacks on individuals, whether it's himself, meaning the judge, whether it's the, um, you know, the lawyers, the prosecutors, uh, Alvin Bragg himself, any of the witnesses. Donald, Donald refused to um, abide by Judge Mershon's, you know, rules. And that's just who Donald Trump is. But, Michael, to your point, do you think that we're going to see a gag order in this case, seeing how Trump cannot control himself and keep his mouth shut? Yeah, I certainly hope not, because that would fall right into Donald's playbook. Again, don't forget, I was involved in writing so much of that playbook early on. If, in fact, the Judge Mershon goes ahead and puts a gag order, the first thing Donald will do is have his counsel uh, file for a, um, a, claim, a claim or make a motion 
for a violation of his First Amendment constitutional rights, um, something he knows very well, which is what revenge is, <laughs> is really all about, how, you know, Donald Trump will weaponize the Department of Justice, and he will use that to slow the case down. On top of that, he will use it regardless of how the result of that case comes out. He will then use it to try to have Judge Mershon recused and then try to compound his, you know, nonsensical request to have the case moved to someplace else, someplace that he deems to be more favorable. So I certainly hope that, you know, they don't fall into that trap because that's exactly what Donald is thinking right now. You know, Michael, I want to take a turn to something a little bit more serious. Uh, you and I have spoken about this idea, which we can tune in and turn the TV off if we don't want to watch this anymore, this being the Trump saga. Um, you know, some of us may stop watching the Katie Fang show, move on with their day on Saturday, and then maybe forget what, about why it. Would anybody, why would anybody do that? Why would anybody but, stop watching but, the Katie Fang show? <laughs> Oh, that, thank you for that point. But, you know, Michael, but you and your family, you're living this. And what I really wanted our viewers to understand is the level of vitriol, hatred, um, and the legitimate physical threats against your safety and that of your family that you are suffering right now because of Donald Trump. Well, it's true. I mean, unfortunately, we can't shut it off, especially uh, I can't shut it off. Now, while I'm here in New York City and, let's say, 92, 93 percent of all of the people who pass me by in the street as I continue to try to lead some semblance of a normal life, um, trying to get back to my old life, people will come over and say, thank you for standing up for truth to power. Thank you for doing what you're doing. Um, you know, don't give up. It's very easy to give up. It's not so easy to stay in the um, in the moment, as unfortunately I'm, I'm forced to be. But then there's always those seven people out of a hundred that they just they're they're magas and they are true diehard Trump supporters. I mean, the level of the vitriol, as you've expressed, is off the charts. Um, especially through social media, uh, which is easier to ignore than the person on the street. I, I told you this story. I think it's only fair to tell the viewers. I was literally on 63rd Street and 3rd Avenue going to an appointment when a guy in New Jersey license plate, um, brand new BMW, stops his car, leaves it in the middle of the street, gets out and he wants to, you know, wants to engage in a physical altercation. And I asked him to get back into his car because I won't back down. Um, and so, you know, we had a standoff literally in the middle of the street with horns honking and so on. Um, this is the level of insanity that Donald Trump brings to the table. And these people, for whatever reason it might be, decide that they want to take on his fight, despite the fact they've never met him that they have to acknowledge that Donald would, do, he wouldn't do a thing. He wouldn't lift his finger to help them if they were on fire across the street and he had a glass of water, because that would require him to walk across the street. But yet, look at the things that they're willing to do. And if they were smart, they would look at the January 6th insurrectionists, the thousand of them that are right now sitting in jail or prison simply because they were doing what Donald told them to do. Meet you at the Capitol. Oh, you know, um, he hasn't helped a single one of them, which is, I believe, going back to the very first point that you brought up, which is exactly why nobody, I mean, what, they, what do you have, tens and tens of supporters there? The biggest group of people happened to be, you know, the media, which not only was it the same thing there, but the same in front of his apartment yeah. over on Fifth Avenue. Nobody. Yeah.